Uh, without any further ado, please welcome Marco to Bergen and uh, this talk. Take it away. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, hello. Um, I'm a bit confused. It's a bit too early. It's uh, 45 minutes earlier than in the plan, or is it in the talk? It was later. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Marco. Um, I'm uh, heading the European research team for Kaspersky. And um, after my talk in Vegas, um, I already had some talks with Pear and thought of new things which were not really covered yet with passwords. I mean, uh, mostly people think of, well, there are accounts, whatever. And I was thinking, okay, hmm, there's a lot more out there people should care about. And criminals are. And I just want to give you a view from my perspective, from part of my daily life, what I see, uh, what criminals and even with malware uh, are doing. And yeah, let's start with the first part. I have several ones. Let's start with an easy one. Uh, with um, commonly used systems in the internet, CMS. And there are quite a lot of them. I mean, WordPress installations, Joomla, I mean, tons of websites in the internet are driven by these CMS. And of course, maybe you know, there are already a lot of tools doing brute forcing attacks on these, um, for example, WordPress sites. And this tool, for example, was used uh, attacking more than 25,000 WordPress uh, utilities by infected machines. So Windows machines got infected and, and the, uh, the user didn't see it, of course. This tool together with a dictionary was dropped on the Windows machine and was executed in the background. And they just had also a list of more than 25,000 URLs uh, hosted with WordPress and tried to guess the uh, logins. Then there's WP Broad and Full CMS Brute Force, which is also targeting more than just WordPress and Drupal, also some smaller things. And these are also used by pen testers, of course, not only criminals. And a lot of these tools are also covered and collected into Backtrack. This is a Linux distribution for doing pen testing and security stuff. And I just had a look and thought, okay, there are these tools, what kind of dictionaries do they use? I mean, these people. Maybe there's some difference, maybe not. Uh, they have a dark code LST uh, dictionary in this backtrack distribution. And of course, the famous, all-known, well-known, Everybody has a drug you, of course. And just to check a bit, um, I wanted to um, see what's inside the dark code LST. And to be honest, it's not so good. Uh, I needed to remove uh, a lot of duplicates. So from 1.7 million words, 1.4 were unique. And it's crazy combination of a lot of collections of different word lists with a lot of trash. Um, I mean, even the disclaimer where all the different dictionaries were mentioned, which were integrated into uh, this dictionary is 30 lines, something like that, a big block of just crazy, uh, crazy stuff. And when just having a look at the length of all these passwords, it's clear that's the common distribution, what you all have in the uh, common word list you find out there. And of course, the char sets is also mostly uh, lower alpha. So it's nothing magic what these people use here. It's just regular common stuff, like just simple hitting in the known stuff, um, which is not so 
not so heavy or extreme. So I went a bit further. And in April this year, there was a huge, huge attack targeting WordPress sites. Uh, more than 90,000 were hacked. And I was a bit depressed and checked for the uh, um, list of um, usernames and passwords which were used or gotten through this attack. And later I also got my hands on another dictionary used in a live attack. So I thought, okay, maybe the ones are the theoretical pen testing ones used. Let's have a look at the real lists people get or uh, use. So the WP password list um, was quite interesting. I mean, 2,927 username password combinations. I mean, at the first moment, it doesn't look so incredible. Um, but in principle, yeah, it dropped down its 20 unique usernames which are used and 1,259 unique passwords. And of course, the most common uh, username was admin, but also some other more strange ones. I mean, I'm not sure who would, that Jessica would be the second most used WordPress uh, admin login. Even I mean, this attack was a bit strange for me, but okay. And when I had a look at the passwords, they were more different than the theoretical dictionaries I found in the backtrack, for example. I mean, I was guessing something like, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. I mean, that's the common stuff, uh, but that the most frequently used password in there was JMR9760. Okay, be sunny. Okay, that's a nice one. Uh, I also found some, some very interesting passwords, very long, uh, with uh, just a complete domain name, adding a few special characters. Um, so that's an interesting dictionary. I mean, from more than 90,000 WordPress installations. That's okay. So there is definitely a different, different, different um, word lists and dictionaries the real criminals use beyond these theoretical, well-spread, well-known password lists because there is a huge difference. Um, so I was digging a bit further into that area of uh, CMS hackings, and I mean, the first stuff that was, yeah, just the common brute force tools, but um, there's a bit more than just these tools. There's also uh, malware doing this in a very automated way. Uh, and there were, for example, this year the uh, Ford Disco botnet, uh, more than 25,000 infected Windows machines, and they compromised more than 6,000 websites. Um, also just by brute forcing, okay, they also got some, some dictionaries. And in this attack, uh, they also mostly used the admin username, I, the, no, the admin uh, password, of course. And uh, yeah, the common numbers like one, two, three, four, five, and stuff like that was the mostly successful passwords in this, of course. So, principle interesting. This botnet was successful with the standard, the common passwords, you know. The others were a bit more exotic. So it's a big bit big mixture of stuff. Okay. Coming to the more interesting stuff after the entry. Um, that's one thing I was talking with Per, uh, that devices. I mean, every day we have a lot of devices around us, 
supporting our lives, supporting our activities. And these devices are protected by? <coughs> yes. And um, I would start with the um, most important device for many of us, I think. Uh, the device which connects us to the internet. And everybody who knows South Park knows that this is the picture of the internet. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think most of you guys have this kind of device at home. And yeah. But I won't talk about more dictionaries in this um, part, but we are talking about direct brute forcing. And the first thing I just, mm, I was looking at it was, I think, three weeks ago, this one came out. Um, it was a um, Trojan targeting these boxes, D-Link. And it was nothing too fancy. It was a compiled out of its script. Auto it is some scripting language for Windows where you can automate a lot of stuff. And you can also compile it so you just have an executable. This one was, ex uh, was compiled for Windows 64. And this was really not using any dictionary at all. It was just, here is a, a screenshot of a part of the source code. It was just going from length 1 till 10 with all the upper, lower case and digits, so no special characters or whatever. And it was just iterating over every length with all the different combinations and try to lock in these uh, D-Link devices to somehow connect to their uh, system. And to be honest, this one was is not really um, that impressive because the end routine didn't do anything very special. Um, but it was interesting to do this kind of um, simple brute forcing algorithm targeting just your router device. And OK. After that, um, I looked a bit further. And we already had kind of these attacks also in the past. and. Uh, this one is a bit newer, um, where an attacker tries to uh, access your router through your computer uh, by utilizing JavaScript. And in this case, it was against TP-Link routers. And what the script does, it, uh, that's a screenshot of part of the script, just a part. Um, and here you see that uh, it tries to connect with the uh, uh, default username and password uh, to uh, the hopefully uh, router and tries to drop a new uh, extended part of a firmware to change the DNS servers in order to do man in the middle attacks. And I mean, that's a very very simple attack, but uh, uh, also very interesting. I mean, who thinks about that when you surf the internet that you may be uh, the, uh, the entry point of attacking your own router and infect it or change setting it uh, in the router in a malicious way? And okay. Then I looked a bit further, of course, and also very new. This was just also a few weeks ago. Um, another warm, malicious code um, was a bit spreading, so it's not that highly spreading. Uh, it's a, a Linux warm. And this one is a bit more, mm, let's say, intelligent. Uh, it's not only focusing on one specific device, like the uh, ones before, the one only for D-Link, the other one just for uh, TP-Link. 
Uh, this one is targeting just a bunch of different devices. And besides routers, also setup boxes like what you have for your TV and even uh, internet connected security cameras. Uh, also, it doesn't matter which, um, uh, which chipset these boxes run, it can uh, target different like ARM, MIPS, uh, PPC platforms. And what it does, it tries to exploit these devices with a known vulnerability in PHP and has a hard-coded list of also credentials, of course, like the default credentials for all these kind of boxes and uh, tries to authenticate with that. I mean, that's just a few examples of what's going on out there. And what stays at the end? Um, think about your devices. I mean, really think about it. Is it really uh, good just to plug it in as suggested and connect to the internet and not, not caring about it anymore? Maybe people should think about um, changing the passwords. Like default passwords, not the best thing in these devices. Um, what else? I mean, routers, internet connected devices, one thing. Um, but to be honest, there is a bit more in your network. What do these devices have in common? What do they have in common? What do you see here? They're printers. <laughs> They're printers. <laughs> correct, correct. But I mean something different. They're all on the network. Hmm? They're all on the network. They're all vulnerable to CVE 20134807. All different devices, of course. There's no duplicate one. But uh, what is this vulnerability? It's very, very, very interesting vulnerability, um, which says, OK, you can uh, use this URL, just exchange the IP address, of course, with the IP address of the printer. And you get, when you put it into some browser, to this address. And yes, you read it right. There is something about a HTTP password. And there is a long string. And yeah, that's the admin password. Looks a bit encrypted. Or is it? Nah. No, it's not encrypted. It's just uh, hex. It's just um, plain text. So this is the admin password for the printer. And um, not so good. And if you use this URL, if the Wi-Fi is enabled, you directly get it in plain text. The pen, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's. <laughs> I was really, really thinking I wanted to add this GIF somewhere in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can blame it all on, on, the, on the Marcus, Marcus Weyer. <laughs> yeah. Last year, kittens, add kittens to your presentations. <laughs> yes. Natural evolution. Um, yeah. In principle, what I wanted to show with these parts were that you have more on your network where I should think about and where passwords are a very essential part. I mean, uh, with, the, um, uh, with this, for example, um, small companies or um, yeah, small environments, uh, administrators tend to use the same password at different locations. Uh, and there is a, it's very likely that this password may also be the main domain administrator password or something similar. So these small devices with this vulnerability may open up your whole network to an attacker just by exploiting the printer. 
And uh, to be honest, I know of attacks utilized and were done in this way, like just attacking different network devices, getting into the intellectual property of the company and steal it. And also grab the money, of course. Um, but attacks are not always just bad. They're also, in some parts, quite interesting if you're aware of. You can just expand your horizon. And this is something also what I do from time to time, of course. And there are a lot of automated attacks. I mean, I talked about CMS systems and whatever. And one essential service in the internet on most web servers is, of course, SSH, you know. And there are also a lot of automated attacks targeting SSH uh, services and just trying different username password combinations in order to somehow get to the machine and use it for other attacks, of course. And I just have one, not, not one, but I just used this one. Uh, had a look at this V server I have at some German ISP and it runs for 80 months now. And I just checked the logs uh, from time to time for the SSH connections. And I found out that within these 18 months, I had more than 1,500 unique, unique attacker IPs. So this means more than two per day. And they tried more than 4,600 attacks within these range. So this means also roughly more than eight attacks per day. Uh, just trying to brute force and somehow access my machine. And luckily I have some system to just prevent after an amount of failed logins and also some other stuff. Um, and interestingly, uh, there were 30 common usernames used, like root and stuff like that, and also more than 430 totally unknown to me, unknown usernames used in this. So the criminals also uh, just compile from time to time their successful credentials to their word list and just check it against other uh, servers. Um, so of course, mostly was root used and uh, bin is used. So people should be aware of this. And if you want to have bit more insight into this. Um, there were people who created some very nice utilities, uh, so-called honeypots. A honeypot is just a system, mostly faking stuff and uh, making it easy for you to trace these kind of attacks. And of course, which is more interesting, uh, collect the username and password combinations they use, which is interesting for you, of course, to see what kind of passwords we sh you shouldn't use, of course. Uh, maybe you shouldn't use passwords at all, but use public keys, but anyway. Um, and um, very interesting, the uh, Kippo honeypot. It's all open source, of course. Um, it's also doing the logs in full way, so you can completely replay what the uh, people do when they have, for example, success to log into your box, so you can really watch what the attacker is doing on the system in a live way. So I just wanted to show you this because I found it hilarious. Uh, and um, yeah, and if you want to have a look at some bigger lists of passwords collected in this way from these kind of uh, honeypots. There are some, uh, there's the uh, Hive in the US and uh, AUs in Australia, which run a large installation of SSH honeypots and publishing all the username password combinations used on their SSH passwords. <coughs> this is, um, quite interesting. If you're interested in this kind of thing and also 
want to have a look at real, um, real used uh, dictionaries from the criminals, have a look at these ones. And after all that, um, this is an kind of an idea I had uh, to be a bit more creative, of course. Um, there's a, another kind of attack going on every day, you know it, spam. Um, I think most people of you know what it is. You know it? It's like when you open your mailbox and you get a bunch of just nonsense and stuff you're not interested in, of course. And lately I just was thinking about, hmm, why should I delete all these spam messages? In principle, it's quite interesting. I mean, I have now huge collections. I have some folders, and I just move all the spam there for later when I have some idea like this one I had here. And what I did, I just exported all these spam mails, just, just a few of them from one account. Um, I passed it, split it, removed unwanted uh, characters, unified it, and I did some, yeah, it was an, a try to create some kind of word list out of these uh, stuff because in spam mails you have a lot of different languages, a lot of different kinds of words, also mistyped words, which is uh, quite interesting. And I did some, some test, of course, what can you test against? I created this word list and thought, okay, let's check how it's um, functioning when you compare it to Rocky. And my list was more than 20, uh, five, uh, 28 megabyte of spam mails compiled to a word list of the size more than 3.3 million unique uh, words, which is a bit more than 23% of the RQ. So, yeah. And when comparing these both, uh, I came to 31, no, nearly 32,000 of matches, so similar uh, things between RQ and the spam mails, which is, I mean, compared to RQ, just Older two percent, so not that much. Um, but in principle, from my perspective, as a proof of concept, quite interesting. And I think I will follow this a bit more to see if maybe uh, combinations from full sentences and stuff like that uh, may be interesting because it's stuff, it's content you get every day. I mean, everybody gets it somehow. And which maybe not only be uh, time wasting, but also maybe we can use it somehow for uh, this kind of uh, fun things like this. And last but not least, um, this will be the next one will be my last slide, which is just a funny thing. I just want to show everybody. Uh, just lately, I go. I went to some website, it was lego.com, and I thought, okay, let's check out the registration. And I didn't write it. I, I didn't write it. I just put the screenshot and added it here, and you just can go to lego.com and see this uh, very interesting advice. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody, if anybody in this room would agree with that. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Yeah, in this way, thanks, and if you have any further questions, um, just talk to me, maybe today evening. Okay, the question was uh, if it 
if it's becoming easier to attack websites, and yeah. in principle, all these kind of attacks. In principle, yes. The problem is that um, um, the criminals, it's not that kind of mafia what people thought in the past. It's you have a lot of individual p uh, people, um, and one is specialized in one area, like creating a malware, creating a tool, creating crypto, creating a service, whatever. And just exchanging and sharing this for money, some do it for free, whatever. And these people just create with their knowledge these tools, and other people who has in principle who have no knowledge can just simply use these tools for doing attacks. So yeah, it's becoming very easy, and that's a big problem. What we have not only for attacking websites, but in principle for doing all kinds of attacks, like what I mentioned, botnets. Today it's so easy. I mean, uh, these interfaces for uh, completely having control about thousands, hundreds of thousands of bots, infected machines, it's just so easy. And that's a big problem. Um, because in this way you don't need to be a very deep technical person like these whatever hacker do. Uh, you just can be an ordinary person, go somewhere, pay a few hundred bucks and that's it. Um, yeah. Uh, the question was what I think about the Internet of Things because this is now an ongoing uh, topic and what we are doing in this area. And yeah, this is uh, a very interesting topic. I had a lot of talks about this at IFA in Berlin where this is a very common topic, like all kind of smart gadgets. And your refrigerator gets connected to the internet and your TV and your bath tube and your toilet and whatever. And I mean, in principle, what I had this one example in the uh, uh, the swarm targeting def uh, different kind of devices, like also set-top boxes, which fall in this category and uh, security webcams. So of course, there is a potential of attacking these devices. Um, there are also a lot of examples of uh, completely different devices, like medical devices now become connected. So all kind of daily devices you even don't think about get connected to the internet. Um, insulin pumps, uh, pumps, for example, and stuff like that. And I think it's a big problem. It's a really big problem. People should think about it. And at the moment, of course, we cannot do much like just here is the software for it, install it, because on most of these devices you cannot install anything. Um, but of course we are also following the trends and see what we can do to protect. And at the moment the best thing we can do is education. Education, education, education. Make people aware of, but not only the consumer, that's an important thing here, but also the vendor, because most vendors think, okay, New technology, let's bring it out to the market. Security, what? Security, what? Uh, because it costs time, it costs resources. The time to market should be short to, uh, to be on the, on the edge, to bring new technologies, to get new customers and stuff like that. But all of these devices, uh, smart TVs. Uh, oh, I have an LG TV at all, yes. <laughs> Cars, everything. I mean, it's 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 definitely. Uh, Is, 
Yeah, the question. The question I, need, I need to repeat for recording. Uh, uh, the question was if uh, and printers and scanners are uh, some kind of uh, storage devices and if it's possible to access these uh, kind of storage devices where these printed or scanned documents, whatever, are stored from the remote. And uh, to be honest, I you don't can. know. You can. I, I haven't, I don't know if there are any vulnerability in this area, so. Well, I mean, just going through, uh, I've done penetration tests before where I was able to, you know, it was, uh, it was a printer from a local network, default username, default password, and by going in as an administrator, you could see a list of uh, documents that had been scanned, as an example, on a multi-copy device. And one of the things that I found stored on the printer was a copy of the passport of the chief financial officer at this company. Because you connected it to his phone, I think. Uh, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I printed a copy of his passport and gave it to him. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he got a message. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are with five minutes left. Yeah, it's not that important one question regarding your last slide. What the maximum damage an attacker can do on the Velo web page if you check on my account? Ah, <laughs> uh, you can, you can, oh yeah. <laughs> What's the maximum damage uh, of the uh, attacking the Lego account? I mean, uh, several things. Uh, one thing is that you enter your um, personal information. So it's clearly a privacy problem. And if it's going a bit further when you do shopping, for example, and somehow store credit card information. And of course, never, never underestimate the uh, uh, regular user who uses the same password at all different services which are out there. And if this password is the same as for the Gmail account and the Facebook account and the whatever account and the banking account, uh, yeah. So I think the damage is, could be, theoretically, as you know. Sorry, I was very curious, Kirsten. Do you, have you looked at demographics in terms of ages and looked at, is there any way of determining a particular age group who seems to be the most Okay, the question was uh, the uh, distribution of ages, how in principle vulnerable they are for using the same passwords, the passwords, like, I think we had some, didn't we also had some talks in the past about this kind? I well, think. I, I would be, uh, I, I will actually touch just a little bit onto that about, okay. that I thought about pin codes in a moment. Uh, but also, it's one of the things that I'm really interested in looking into, and you ought to be looking into it uh, more. I'm, I'm really interested in <coughs> profiling people. Uh, I'm interested in profiling people and uh, <laughs> uh, to figure out if there are differences between both PIN codes and also passwords, passphrases used by uh, male, female, uh, and different age. Uh, of course, different across different borders, languages, as an example. And we have seen lots of that stuff already. Uh, depending on the kind of service, as an example, you're using, you will actually use a password that is, uh, in some way, resembles the service you are using. Age groups is also of interest. But uh, I, I think somebody somewhere had some data on that as well. But we need to look. analyzing uh, Yahoo passwords, approximately 70 million passwords in Yahoo. What was it the last year one, or? Hmm? 
Hmm? Was it? I think it was Ross. Yeah, yeah. Ross Peter came out. Yeah, from, yeah. from Joe Bonner, right? Cambridge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he had age, uh, he had demographic, uh, demographics and also had age groups. And also I have a bit of information about passwords that were specific to certain properties as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah, new large corpus. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Okay, Marco will be uh, with us today and tomorrow as well. And the day after us. And the day after that. <laughs> yeah, so Yay. please use the opportunity to talk to him. Now we'll do our 20 minute break before touch on.